Hi. Uh, in the last lesson, uh, what we did is we discussed the one commodity model. Um, what I, in, in, uh, in, in constructing the productivity relation, okay? And what I like to do is I like to continue on with the um, with, with, with that framework, okay? And so what we have here is that we, if you recall, all right, what we looked at here is that we had our one commodity model, right? We have our one commodity physical structure production. So we come here and we say, okay, this is going to be our physical structure of production, okay? With our physical structure of production, we saw that we're going to have, it looked like this, we're going to have A11, which is going to be equal to five quarters of corn, L1, which is going to be equal to one hour of labor. And again, the numeric exam, the numbers are just used to illustrate. Don't get lost in the numbers. They're just completely heuristic and illustrative. That's going to be in round T. It's going to produce a gross output of eight quarters of corn. And then we're going to have a net output of three quarters of corn. And that's going to be the point. It's going to be, this is going to be your net output. And what we saw last time was a relationship between the, the all, 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 all relations, let, let me just be clear. We're going to see there's going to be a relationship between the outputs, the gross outputs of the industry and the net output as well as the means of production requirements for the subsequent round of production, right? And we saw that when we net out those five quarters of corn, we're left with the relationship of a magnitude of living labor, L1, which is going to be equal to one hour. And again, we keep it as an hour in order to keep it simple and actually very, uh, very easy to illustrate certain propositions is going to be equal to, is going to be related to Y1, which is going to be equal to the, uh, to the net output. And they're not going to be equal, but there's going to be a congruency. And that's what I'm arguing here. Again, my interpretation of the way and what we can get out of Srapa's framework is this relationship here. So we have what I call the net relationship, or so you can see this as a, a net congruency, right? And so we have in this net congruency relationship an association of the amount of living labor with the amount of newly created net output. Now, what we can do is we can evaluate this. We can multiply this by the labor productivity. It's going to be Y, lowercase y, times L is going to be equal to the, uh, is going to be equal to the national income. And you can multiply this by its price form. This is going to be aggregate expenditure, which is going to be equal to the price times the net output. The price of good one times the net output, where this is going to be equal to the labor productivity. Y is going to be equal to our net labor productivity. All right, net labor productivity, which is here, and then P1 is going to be equal to the value relation, which is this is going to be equal to, we saw, with so many good one per unit L, right? Now, so what we saw here is that that's going to be related in value, that so there's going to be a value relation on the income account side that's going to have a, is going to be equal to the value relation on the output account side in terms of the net relation. And we're going to come back to this, but this is going to be the relation in Shropa's paragraph 10, and this is going to be the relation in Strapa's paragraph 12. Now, in paragraph 10, I, I mean, people are saying, well, Carter, uh, there's a point in paragraph 10, uh, Strapa does this. He makes L equal to 1. What's, what happens is Strapa in paragraph 10 makes L equal to 1, and in paragraph 12, uh, he makes the price of the net output equal to 1. Right, And so what I'm arguing is that, well, there's going to be an implicit value form here that really what's happening in paragraph 10 is that it's going to be 1 times L, okay, where this 1 here, this 1 is going to be equal to labor productivity when we're in the labor theory of value, all right? This is going to be the labor productivity in the labor theory of value, all right? Labor productivity of labor in the labor theory of value with the labor theory of value. All right, and I'm going to talk about this. And one of the things I said it in, in, in the previous lecture is that um, my understanding, and, and I'm not attributing this necessarily to Srapa, but certainly what I can get out of Srapa is that the labor theory of value is going to be an expansive theory that is going to have a labor bestow component. Right, and it's also going to have a labor commanding component. 
all right? And then the idea is that bestow and command are not two competing measures of value. I think that's one of the biggest erroneous, uh, uh, the biggest errors we've been having in heterodox and Marxian and Sarathian political economy, especially the Marxian variant, where you have Marxists or what, whoever are critiquing each other because labor commanded is not labor bestowed. And it's like, are you kidding me? All right. I mean, uh, and, and Srop is addressing this, guys, by the way. He's, in my opinion, okay, Srop is addressing this and he's talking about the, um, the, 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 the relations, the, the relations there, right? So what we have here is that fundamental relationship, right? And so what we have then is we can express our physical structure production in terms of the productivity parameters, right? We saw that the first productivity parameter was going to be equal to the net product of labor, right? The net productivity of labor, this again, was equal to three quarters per unit. The second one was going to be equal to the net productivity of capital, or the cap, or, or the or the net output capital ratio. This is equal to the scalar value here because it's a pure number. Uh, going to be 0.6. This is also equal to the maximum rate of profit. And then lastly, what we had was the capital labor ratio, where this is going to be equal to the capital input over the labor input. This is going to be equal to five uh, five quarters per labor, right? And so this, again, is going to be net labor productivity, all right? It's going to be net labor productivity, productivity. This is going to be equal to net capital productivity. I'm going to put capital in quotation mark, capital productivity in quotation marks, heterodox economists. Uh, with good cause, we have reason not to uh, think that capital is productive. It's human beings that are productive, that apply capital, and everybody increase their productivity, but never mind. Uh, but we're going to go to capital productivity, and then this is going to be equal to the cap the so-called capital output, uh, capital labor ratio, capital labor ratio, which is going to be the proxy of the technique, right? It's going to the, the level of technique or the technology, and then from there we can draw that in distribution space, okay? And then when we draw that in distribution space, what we saw was this, all right? And so we draw this in distribution space in the following way, all right? And so in drawing in distribution space. This is going to be equal to labor productivity. This is going to be equal to capital productivity, or, or the output capital ratio, the net output capital ratio. And then this becomes what I call the productivity schedule. All right. And so the slope here is going to be equal to negative the, uh, the, the capital output ratio. Here we're going to be negative five units per labor. Right. And we saw that this is going to be equal to three units per labor is equal to y. This is going to be equal to 0.6. All right, we saw it's going to be the slope. I should have drawn it such that you can go through, and then you can see that you go down over, you're going to have the negative slope. We did that in the last lesson. But that is going to be what I call this is the productivity schedule. All right, now what we got to do, productivity schedule. All right, now what we have to do, okay, is that we have to consider the productivity schedule in terms of the income account and then the output account. So now we're going to introduce the net relation. So we're going to have our income account here, and we're going to have our output account here. Our income account is going to be the distribution schedule. All right, distribution schedule. It's going to be the same graph, right, the same line, uh, but it's going to now have the profit and the wages on it, and this is going to be the growth schedule or the consumption growth schedule, all right? I'll call it the growth schedule, all right? And they're going to, again, it's going to be the same line, except that's going to have growth and, um, and, and, and investment, okay? And so, so looking at that is what we do. And so now we take our physical structure production, right? We, can sell, we conceive of the ratios of uh, net productivity of, of so-called capital and of labor. We then look at the um, slope as the negative of the capital labor ratio. And now what we're gonna do is that we're going to express our relations in terms of the um, in terms of the income and output accounts. We're gonna see, all right, let's consider it in terms of growth in a distribution, and let's consider it in terms of growth, right? So again, we begin with this relationship here that the labor productivity times living labor in the aggregate is equal to the price times the net output in the aggregate, and then you get it there, and you, this would be a vector, et cetera. But that's going to be the relations that we're looking at. This is going to have an income account expression and an output account expression. This is going to be your income accounts, all right? 
and you're going to have here is going to be your output accounts. Output accounts. All right. And so with your income account, you're going to be on the income account of the ledger. We'll say here that the national income is equal to the productivity of labor times the total labor in the economic system. Right. That's going to be on the income account side of the story. This is going to be equal to the wage revenue plus the profit revenue. All right. That's going to be on the income account side. Output account side, we're going to say that the, uh, that, that the aggregate expenditure is going to be equal to the price times the net product. This is going to be equal to the consumption expenditure plus the investment expenditure. All right. And so now what we're doing is we're setting them up so that in the aggregate, they're going to have to be equal. That's going to be the balance condition. All right. That's going to be the balance condition between it. This is, I refer to one of my students, as you, can, you can think of this as aggregate accounting, right? It's going to be more of an aggregate relation. Really, again, this is where the aggregate micro-macro distinction actually kind of falls down. But this would be a simple non-government closed economy GDP, right? So usually your macro course card starts with the output account expression of your net product. Now, what we're saying here is that really that what's important is going to be the value is going to be the productivity of the system in terms of the fact that you have a productivity of labor, which creates a net output and that the value relation cements them together, if you will, such that the value of that net labor productivity is going to be equal to the value of that net output, right? And so from there, we can express it in terms of our income and our output accounts, which we're going to have here. Now, of course, what is key behind this, all right, I'm going to put it right here, is going to be the relationship between on these on the income account savings related to on the output account investment. All right, and then we're going to be going through the relationship between savings and investment as we go. Suffice it here to say that aggregate savings is going to be defined as the savings propensity out of wage revenue times the wage revenue plus the savings propensity, is a lowercase s, this, savings propensity of, ton, of the profit revenue times the profit revenue. What we're going to say here, that S sub I is going to be equal to the savings propensity out of income I, right? Savings propensity out of income of type I, where I is going to be equal to wage type income or profit type income. And this tells us that the aggregate savings are going to be equal to the savings that comes out of wages plus the savings that comes out of profits. Now, as we go through this lesson today, I'm going to keep the simple assumption that we're going to, we, we, we make the simplifying assumption. Okay, we're going to make the simplifying assumption that workers do not save. All right, that the savings propensity out of wage revenue is zero. All right, that means that workers do not save. All right, workers do not save. All right, it's going to be now, if you have a savings propensity, I should come here, right? If we're going to look at the savings propensity, if SI is a savings propensity, that means that one minus SI is going to be the consumption propensity. All right, so this becomes the consumption propensity. And when we're looking at the consumption propensity, we see that, well, if this is going to be equal to zero in terms of the savings propensity, that means that one minus the savings propensity is equal to one. All right, this means that workers consume all their wages. All right, workers consume all wage revenue. All right, what Kaletsky, the, uh, the Polish economist that was writing... Uh, at the same time as Keynes was, uh, Mikhail Kalecki will say that workers uh, spend what they get. All right. And so they're going to get their wage and they're going to spend it on their revenue. So those are going to be the assumptions that we're going to be making here. Right. And so that's going to be the relationship. So mapping the savings to the investment, that's going to be the key. All right, as, as I'm doing it here, savings is going to be mapped to investment. Now, note that doesn't have to be the case. Right. It can go the other way as well. 
All right. In fact, we're going to see that that's going to be precisely the uh, what distinguishes different heterodox theories. Right. What we're going to see. I'll, I'll write it here. What we're going to see in terms of the closure. If savings determines investment, that's going to be a classical closure. All right. Classical mechanisms. So it's equal. All right, are going to be classical mechanisms. If, however, investment is going to lead to savings, this is going to be post-Keynesian mechanisms. All right, and so uh, post-Keynesian, post-Keynesian. All right, generally speaking, I, I'm not going to get into the different theories and 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 like any, and like anything else. Don't take my word for it. Right, well, figure it out yourself. I, I, I'm here to tell you this is how I see things, and by all means, you know, don't take my don't take my word for it. But I do think that this is a good way to uh, begin to break down the relations, the causal relations here. Now, the way I go, and it goes to my Marxian roots, if you will, is we look uh, a lot to the classical framework here in this perspective. What Schrappa does is an interesting and open question, and it has to do with the notion of the determination of the wage, right? The wage bundle versus the wage share. How Schrappa makes that determination of the wage. I will say, where is it? I will say that the, uh, oh, here it is. I will say that in this, in terms of the, in terms of the Mallorca draft, that's what I'm getting here. In terms of the Mallorca draft, uh, which are the uh, notes that Sarafa wrote in March of 1955. I think in one of my lectures I had said that he wrote it in January of 1955. He left for the island of Mallorca in January 1955. He wrote the the Mallorca draft in March of 1955. He had some of his notes sent down there, etc. The point is that by the time of the Mallorca draft in, in, in uh, March of 1955, Schraba had adopted the wage share. He had abandoned the bundle, the, the so-called subsistence wage that we hear so much about in terms of how Schraba accepted or not. And again, we'll get into the question of the wage, but it has relevance here. Okay, because then we start looking at mechanisms of closure here. This is a, this is a mechanism of balance between income and output accounts. And closure of the distribution parameter is, is kind of what Trump was talking about. But the ideas are still um, cogent and they're still resonant here in terms of the different mechanisms that, 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 that close it, right? So let's draw this. Okay, so we're going to be coming through and we're going to be looking at this framework and especially the savings equal investment relationship. This is the core of most macro theories, right, is how they can, uh, can express that, that, that balance, how, how this can... Uh, can manifest, right? And so what we're going to be looking at is this, all right? So that's going to stay, all right? Because that's going to be our fundamental balance. Now, in trying to understand this, okay, what we're going to do is that we're going to take our different expressions of our, our, of our model, okay? So we come here. So this is going to be y is equal to w plus z, Okay, so the value added is going to be equal to the wage revenue plus the profit revenue. And this is going to be C plus I is equal to Y. Or let me actually do it now. Let me quit being coy. All right, let me do it this way. All right, this is going to be here. And this is going to be Y is equal to C plus I. All right, now, okay, so we have both of our accounts, our income account, revenue structure, output account, uh, uh, expenditure structure. We're going to see that in terms of expressing the um, expressing the relations, right? In terms of expressing the relations, we're going to have the following, right? That the uh, that that the profit here is going to be profit z is going to be equal to the rate of profit multiplied by the means of production a. Okay, this is going to be the investments. Okay, investment i is going to be equal to the growth rate of the capital stock with the natural rate of growth referred to in the Passanetti literature and in the Caldor Passanetti literature. This is called the natural rate of growth or the natural rate of growth, which is going to be here. Okay. Or we would say that R is the profit rate. It's going to be profit over the means of production. And then GN is going to be the, uh, the natural rate of growth is going to be investment over the means of production. All right. And so what we're having here then are going to be the relationship between the profit rate and the natural growth rate or is going to be the natural rate of growth. All right. The so-called natural growth rates. All right. It's also referred to, especially in the Marxian literature, as capital accumulation rates. 
All right, capital accumulation is going to be the rate of capital accumulation. It's not the growth rate of your of your GDP, right? It's going to be the growth rate of your capital stock at that natural rate. Now, with that, then you're going to be able to write your equations. Okay, so this then becomes y is equal to w plus r times a, right? And this is going to be equal to y is equal to c plus gn times a, all right? Now what we're going to do is that we're going to express it in terms of this space. So what we're going to put on the vertical axis is the wage and the consumption. And so what we're going to do is we're going to solve for wages here, all right? So we come here and we're going to solve for wages. And over here, we're going to solve for consumption. All right, because we're going to put it on that, we're going to have that vertical intercept. So this then is W is equal to Y minus R times A. And then here we have C is equal to Y minus G N times A. So we see then that we have the same vertical intercept, right? We're going to have the same slope, the slope being the output capital ratio, A. Here it's in terms of levels, but we can express it also in terms of per unit labor. And then we're going to have the horizontal intercepts are going to be the growth rates, the profit rate on the income side, and the growth rate on the output side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this up here. All right, I'm going to put this up here because we're going to manipulate that, right? So we're going to, again, we're going to take this over here. All right, and so we're going to take our income accounts and our output account. All right, I'll put it right here. Okay, this is the income account. So now we're going to, this is going to be called the distribution schedule. All right, now we have our distribution schedule. All right, here, and then this is going to be our growth schedule here. All right, I need some more space. Distribution schedule is going to be here and growth schedule is going to be here, all right? Now, the distribution schedule is going to be on the distribution side. You solve for wages are equal to profits, my, I mean, the net output minus the rate of profit times the, uh, the, the, the capital stock, and this is going to be uh, on, on, the, uh, on the output side. Consumption is going to be equal to, we do it again, Okay, consumption is going to be equal to a, a net output minus the capital accumulation rate or the natural rate of growth of, uh, of capital times the quantity of capital or the means of production input there. Now, what we're going to be doing is this, all right? We're going to now consider the changes in the structure, okay? So what we're going to have is this. Now, we know, for, for example, what, what do we know? Okay, we know that this is going to be the vertical intercept. All right, I'll put it in red. Okay, that this is going to be equal to the vertical intercepts is going to be the Y, right? This is going to be the vertical intercept, vertical intercept here. And we know also that the A is going to be the slope. All right, it's going to be the slope for both of them. So we have the same vertical intercept and the same slope. All right, so the graph, the, the line's going to be there. I'll redraw it in a minute, okay? Now, with that, we have this. You say, all right, well, we have, the, we have this, and we're going to be looking then at the changes on the horizontal intercept are going to be the rate of profit. The changes on the horizontal intercept are going to be the rate of growth. And what we're going to see here, this is going to reflect changes in distribution, and this is going to reflect changes in capital accumulation given changes in the different pro in the propensities to save. We're assuming workers' propensity to save is zero. Hence, this will be determined by the changes in the capitalist propensity to save, the so-called what Keynes would refer to as the animal spirits, right? And so this then we're going to see as the distributive relation. We're going to have the, uh, the, the, the regimes of distribution. We're going to have a pure wage regime of distribution. And we're going to have a pure profit regime of distribution. And that's going to be looking at the upper and the lower limits of the profit rate, right? We're going to see the pure, uh, the, the pure consumption regime of expenditure and the pure investment regime of expenditure, all right? And this is going to be pure investment regime, investment regime of expenditure, 
right? And so what we're going to have is this, all right? And so now we're going to be considering the, uh, the graphs, okay? And then looking at these graphs, we have the following. We're going to have the same graph, all right? I mean, we're gonna, I'm going to draw them uh, over to the right over here in this, as the same, all right? But let's just try to see what these relations are, and then we'll put them together, all right? Now, what we're going to be arguing is this. All right, that the distribution growth schedule, I'll keep it here at, at uh, 10, all right, is going to be this, okay, this is going to be the uh, net outputs, and this is going to be the net output, right, this is going to be the, uh, the, the capital inputs, and this is going to be the, uh, the, the capital input, right, the capital productivity, right, so this is going to be equal to the net output, and this is going to be equal to the, uh, the output capital ratio. So this is the distribution schedule here, and this is the growth. Just uh, this is the growth schedule here, the consumption growth schedule here. All right, this is going to be equal to Y C. This is going to be equal to rho G N. This is going to be rho R. All right, and so what we're going to be looking at is this. Okay, this then becomes the uh, the, the the changes in the distribution. Right, this. It's going to be your maximum, this is going to be equal to your maximum rate of profits. All right, maximum profit rates. Profit rate, which is there, okay? And that this is going to be equal to your maximum growth rate. I'm in my purple, I have it here, okay? This is going to be equal to here, rho is equal to capital G is going to be the maximum growth rate. All right, and so you're going to have at the maximum, the growth rate and the profit rate are going to be the same, okay? This gives us the uh, particular regimes of distribution here. Profits are going to be, so this is going to be pure wages, pure wages, and this is going to be pure profits, pure profits, all right? This here is going to be pure consumption, pure consumption, all right, and then the other extreme is going to be pure investment, pure investment when you're looking at the growth schedule. All right, so the relationship, of course, has to do with how we're looking at the, uh, the, the, the relationship between profitability and growth, right? And so what we're going to consider is here, all right, that the profit rate, and we're going to be assuming that profit comes out, that growth comes out of, uh, savings comes out of profit, and given a savings propensity that's going to be less than um, less than less than one, we're going to have uh, uh, we're going to have uh, investment. But this is going to be our distribution relation for our investment. Let's do our distribution relation now. This is going to be our profit rate. Now, what determines our profit rate? I'll call this our star. Okay, what determines our profit rate? I ain't said. We have not said what determines our profit. Rate. This is going to be the question of the changes in distribution. Right, this is going to be the changes in distribution. Now, what causes the changes in distribution? I'm not saying that's the hundred thousand dollar question here, right? You want to look at what looks at the changes in distribution. This is going to be the, the, the wage and the profit revenue. That's going to be wage revenue and that's going to be profit revenue, okay? And so that's going to be what we refer to as the distribution schedule, right? Distribution schedule. All right, and so with that distribution schedule, we're going to consider all the different profit rates and all the different associated wage rates given the particular technique. Then you move over to the to, to the growth schedule. All right, and so this is going to be your growth schedule. With your growth schedule, you're going to assume that the natural growth rate, right, is going to be your GN. It's going to be some magnitude smaller than the profit rate because we're assuming that um, that 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 the uh, Workers, I mean, the capital is going to consume a portion of it too, right? And so this then becomes your growth, right? This is going to be changes in expenditures, all right? This is changes in expenditures, all right? And so with your changes in expenditures, you're going to have that right there, okay? This becomes the consumption, and this becomes the investment, all right? And so what we do is we put the two together, all right? And putting the two together, we have this. And with putting the two together, we can also consider the relationship between the um, growth rate and the profit rate, the, the simple Cambridge equation 
which we're going to be assuming uh, is going to have a, um, a, a, a savings propensity out of wage revenue, which is going to be equal to um, equal to zero. Okay, which means that it's all going to come out of profit revenue. I'm trying to find my decent, my decent mark. Okay, so this one is going to be here. So we draw the state, we draw the uh, the curve here. Okay, all right, we draw the curve here, and the curve is going to be drawn in the following way. All right, this is going to be the uh, the the the. And we do a two. I mean, a two quadrant graph here. This happening, right? Sorry, guys. All right, we're going to do this one here. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be drawing our two quadrant graph, and looking at our two quadrant graphs, we're going to do the following. Okay, we're going to do right here. All right, sorry, it's a waste of time. Right on. So. Now, in our two quadrant graph, we're going to have the uh, the first quadrant is going to be the um, the wage profit curve and the consumption growth curve, and the second is going to be a relation between the um, between profit and, uh, and and growth. Right. So here you're going to put your labor productivity, your real wage, and your consumption per worker. Okay. Over here, you're going to put your Output capital ratio, your rate of profit, and your growth rate or your natural rate of growth of the uh, 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 of the capital stock, right? You're going to come here. This is going to be the um, the net output capital. I mean, this is going to be your uh, your your graph, right? You're going to put your, uh, your 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 graph is going to be there. Okay, draw a little bit better here. You guys, see this one. I should do it. It's this one. All right, is going to be your your uh, product. I mean, your productivity schedule, your growth distribution schedule is going to be there. Okay, this you're going to put here is going to be equal to the growth rate of the system, the good capital accumulation rates. And what you're going to do here is that you're going to make this a 45 degree line. All right, so this is a 45 degree line. All right, now this 45 degree line is here. All right, so you make this. 45 degree, and this is going to be G sub N, and what you're going to do here is you're going to say here G sub N is equal to R. So you're going to be looking at the relationship between the capital accumulation rate or the natural growth rate and the profit rate, and what we're seeing is that from our simple Cambridge equation, the savings propensity out of profit revenue is going to be equal to the ratio of the capital accumulation rate over the profit rates. All right, that's going to be here when in this is going to be equal to one at that particular graph. I mean, at that particular 45 degree line, this is referred to as the golden rule. All right, so this will be the golden rule. All right, the golden rule growth rate, the golden rule growth rate is going to have growth rates such that the propensity to save is going to be equal to one. And this is going to be your simple Cambridge equation. All right, the Cambridge equation can be more complex if you have a savings propensity out of worker revenue. But this is going to be your Cambridge equation is going to be right here. It's going to be your simple Cambridge equation that says that the savings propensity out of uh, out of uh, uh, wages are going to be equal to. I'm mean, sorry, the savings propensity out of profits are going to be equal to the ratio of the natural rate of growth of uh, of the system divided by the profit rate. Right. So here, then we take our um, our our our. Profits. It's going to be, so this is going to be the uh, output is here, right? It's going to be rho is equal to capital R is equal to capital G, right? It's going to be the maximum growth rate qua maximum profit rate qua output capital ratio given as a productivity parameter, right? This is going to be equal to the net output, uh, the net output productivity of labor, right? This is going to be equal to the profit. So we're going to say our profit is going to be here. And this becomes our profit rate. All right. So we take our profit rate and we read that up to here. All right. So we take this up to here. All right. And we take this to here. This now is going to be the wages. They're going to be the wage revenue here. And this is going to be the profit revenue here. All right. Then we come here and we say, all right, now we're going to be looking at our investment relation. Our investment relation is going to be here. 
This is going to be the growth rate of the uh, system, the, the, um, the natural rate of growth, right, which is going to be less than the profit rate, right? We're going to be assuming if the savings propensity is less than one. This comes up to here, right? And this comes to here, okay? And so what we see then, this is going to be the total consumption here, and this is going to be the total investment here, all right? And so this represents here the consumption of the capitalists here, and this represents the consumption of the consumption out of profit revenue and consumption out of wage revenue, all right? And so now we begin to see again that the wage is equal to, so all this is going to be wage and profit is equal to y, Consumption and investment is equal to Y. Now, the last thing we do is we take this thing down to here. So now we're going to take our growth rate to here, and we cut our 45-degree line this way. All right, so we come across our 45-degree line here. Okay, this is going to be our growth rates. We come down. This is going to be where the growth rate is going to intersect with the profit rate. And then you take the rate from the origin here, and this represents your savings propensity out of your profit revenue. All right, which is going to be right here. This is your savings propensity out of your profit revenue, which is going to be less than one. And so what that tells me is that as I move the savings propensity, as I move this rate up this way, the growth rate goes towards zero. So the savings propensity decreases and the growth rate decreases to zero. As I move it this way, as I take the rate down this way, the savings propensity increases and the growth rate approaches the profit rate here. And you would say that the growth rate increases until it approaches the profit rate. And so there you can begin to see that the, uh, that the dynamics of the system and the one commodity model are going to be associated to that. Now that's where we're going. So this whole thing is referred to as the growth distribution schedule or the distribution growth schedule. Right? Growth distribution schedule. And so with the growth distribution schedule, you have a way in which we can understand the economic system. Now, all that is going to express itself in the two commodity construct when we look at look at its profit. Now what profit does when he looks at production for subsistence is he doesn't take the one commodity model. I, I'm sorry, he doesn't take, he, he looks at the two commodity model. He doesn't take the analysis of the growth relations. He looks only within the relations of distribution. Doesn't even consider the relations of growth. And so we then look at the implications of the value form in a two commodity model with uh, with with uh, on the distribution side when we come to um, when we come to Srafa. okay, and so that's what we're going to be doing. So this is the second lecture that I posted, introducing us into that system, uh, and I think the next one we can start moving uh, more right into production of commodities, chapter two. Thank you very much, guys. This one is thirty-seven minutes, still longer than I wanted. All right. For those who are sticking with me, thank you. I hope these are making sense. The argument here is to the analysis to make it clear as we can. Take it easy. I'll see you online. Peace. Ciao. Bye.